Hello, everyone. We're going to give people a few more minutes to join and then we'll get started. Thanks. All right, we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to Finite States Accelerating Device Vulnerability Management with AI webinar. We will share the recording after the event, and if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. I'd like to introduce our presenter, Nicholas Vitovich, who is the Product Manager of AI Strategy at Finite State. He has over 15 years of experience in cybersecurity and has played a part of the founding engineering team of Battelle Memorial Institute Cybersecurity Division. He holds a computer engineering degree from Ohio Northern University, and I can attest he is very passionate about discussing AI and security-related topics, so you guys are in for a treat today. I'll now turn this over to Nicholas to get the webinar started. All right. Thanks, Aslan, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, uh, whether you're joining live or whether you're watching this later, uh, we're going to be talking today about accelerating device vulnerability management with AI. Our agenda, uh, first we're going to start with a little bit about finite state and who we are, a little bit of background about vulnerability management and product security, SBOMs, VEX, and VDR. Then we're going to talk about some problems in this space. Specifically, there are too many vulnerabilities and not enough time. Then we're going to talk about some solutions that we've developed in this space using AI, specifically focusing on faster development, creating high quality data sets, creating and using SBOMs and VEX and other vulnerability communication. And then we're going to talk about kernel vision. So the reason we call this kernel vision uh, is because we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Linux kernel build configuration and talk about automatically remediating Linux kernel module CVEs. So this is going to be somewhat technical, but I'm hoping to keep it so that it's not too technical overall. So if you don't have a, a very deep technical background, that's no problem. And I'll explain to you how uh, I'm not necessarily the expert or, or wasn't before doing this project. And then we're going to talk about the future of vulnerability management and how we can use AI in other ways. Uh, as long as we stay on time, we should have some time for questions and answers at the end as well. Oh, sorry. All right. So about finite state. This has software risk management for the connected world. Our mission here at finite state is literally to make the world a safer place. So we're really working on building the single pane of glass where you can work on your SBOMs and do SBOM management and also correlate that with other security information so that you can have good visibility across all of your products, the entire software development lifecycle and incident response. We're really focused on solving these huge supply chain problems. So this screen is kind of showing you that we've got a very increasing amount of software supply chain attacks that are happening over the past years, and we expect this to continue to grow. Uh, there are 94% of companies report they're using open source software, and we're going to talk a lot about where that software comes from, how you keep track of that software and understand where it's coming from in the supply chain for your software. 61% of businesses report that they're impacted by software supply chain attacks in the last year. 
So this is really a, a very big problem. That's something that we're really focused on solving here at Finite State. And we're really actually excited to show you some of the developments that we're making in the AI space specifically to address some of these problems. There are countless sources of software. There are tons of unknown components. There's risky licensing and open source code, keeping up to date with software bill of materials and making sure they're constantly evaluated, enriched and monitored uh, for software vulnerabilities, keeping up with regulations and, you know, trying to protect the critical industries specifically around the world uh, is our main focus here. So we're really focused on the supply chain problem. And as we get through this presentation, uh, you'll start to understand what those challenges are in this space and why we're, we're trying to solve this. So first I'd like to give a little bit of background about vulnerability management. Um, so the idea of vulnerability management is to understand vulnerabilities in your software. To do that, first you have to start by identifying the vulnerabilities in the first place. Assessing the vulnerabilities means understanding what's the severity of those, what are the potential impacts. And then ultimately the management portion of this starts with prioritizing those vulnerabilities so that they can be remediated. So again, I'm kind of going through this background pretty quickly because we've got a lot to talk about here, but at a very high level, we're really talking about vulnerability management as a practice for making your products more secure. As we start to think about who we work with, and I believe Aslan mentioned this in, in my background, in my role here at Finite State, I work with very large corporations and specifically their product security organizations uh, for both vendors who are manufacturing devices and the asset owners or the customers of those vendors who are buying the devices and putting them onto their networks. We're focused really a lot in critical infrastructure. Um, and so this is really the background that I'm bringing here is to, to talk about what product security teams are facing and what they need. And for a product security team, they've got, you know, quite a lot to do, but these are some of the, the highest level things that a product security team needs to do. Starting with security assessment, identifying the vulnerabilities and risks in the products, and then influencing secure development. The customers that I personally work with have hundreds or sometimes thousands of products that they're working on building and they've got thousands literally of software engineers and developers and product developers and designers who are building these products and ultimately selling them you know to their customers they need to have a secure development process so for the product security team it's understanding the security of the products but then also influencing the secure development practices of those product development teams so this includes implementing secure coding practices and standards, um, and that goes all the way from the design phase to the development phase and ultimately uh, even beyond. So getting into incident response, once this, the, the product has gone into the market and it's live, continuing to pay attention to the vulnerabilities that may arise for the software that's in those products and then actually doing something about it. So knowing which products are affected and actually working on remediation plans, patches, and so forth. This all ties in also to compliance. Um, and this is specifically internal compliance and external compliance. So there are plenty of regulations in the world. Uh, we're starting to see the CRA, the Cyber uh, Resilience Act coming from the EU. There's going to be a lot of impacts there, but there are plenty of other compliance frameworks that are applicable for product security teams around the world. And they're going to continue to have more stringent sorts of compliance requirements as we go forward. So for the product security team, they're working internally with their team, but also across their entire organization. They work closely with the engineering teams who are doing the product development, their quality teams, and literally pretty much everyone else in their organizations. So for a vendor's product security team, they're talking with everyone who's building, uh, maintaining the product, and all the legality and, and other aspects for the customers who are buying that product, they're making sure that they're collaborating with everyone who's putting the products on the network and actually operating these products to, to do something. Uh, in many cases, when we're talking about critical infrastructure, that includes energy generation, um, energy distribution, 
uh, water and other critical infrastructure, vehicles, medical devices. Uh, these are all the places where, you know, you've got a product security team from the vendors who are making these devices and a product security team uh, for the teams that are actually fielding these devices. So overall, I tried to summarize some, some very high level product security goals. You have to understand and reduce the risk for your products. And then ultimately, you want to improve the security of the products that you're selling to your customers. What this leads to is needing to have visibility for the known vulnerabilities and being able to do incident response when a vulnerability affects one of your products. So very high level, just talking about vulnerability management and product security teams. They're, the core here that we've been focusing on over the past couple of years is the software supply chain. So understanding again, where your software comes from, and the way that we're approaching this is through the software bill of materials as one of the primary things. Um, and then a couple of different technologies for communicating about vulnerabilities. So we've got a few acronyms here. There are going to be plenty of acronyms throughout this, and I hope you don't get uh, overwhelmed by any of those. There are plenty more where these come from. Um, so, you know, don't be intimidated. I'm going to try to break this down as simply as possible. But I'm going to say the word SBOM quite a lot. I'll probably say VEX and I'll say VDR quite a lot, uh, but, but we'll also get into what these things mean. So what is the software bill of materials and why is it important? At the very base level, um, and, and I'm actually part of quite a few working groups about software bill of materials, the SBOMs, and also VEX. Um, the way that we describe this generally is the SBOM is a list of ingredients. So this is all of the software that's going into your product, and that can be coming from open source. It can be coming from proprietary sources um, where you may license a software library, a software package that your teams use, software development kits and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, you're trying to build this list of all of the software that's going into your products. You want to understand what are the dependencies of the software that your teams are building and then also what dependencies do those software have so it really becomes a, a complete supply chain all the way back to you know every open source project that gets used and ultimately be the source code that is being put into those various products that you're putting into your your product the reason we want to do this is so that we can correlate with known vulnerabilities. So for every software package that is included in your product, there are potential known vulnerabilities. So here we'll talk about CVEs. We've got different threat intelligence and security advisory sources where we can correlate and find out about vulnerabilities. Specific vendors will have their own security advisory sources and they'll publish about security issues or vulnerabilities. Um, that they're aware of that are going into their product. But ultimately, we want to get to the point where we can continuously monitor for new vulnerabilities and do incident response when a new vulnerability is reported. So ultimately, the SBOM is the foundation for understanding what software is going into your product and then ultimately what is the uh, impact of any vulnerabilities that, that, may, that may affect any software there. So the question then becomes, how do I get an SBOM or how do I generate an SBOM? There are a few different ways and it really comes down to where in the software development life cycle or at each phase of the software development life cycle, uh, you can generate your software bill of materials. So we talk about generating from source code. So built into your developers uh, IDE, for example, looking at the source code and looking at the package managers and so forth, you can get a very high quality SBOM uh, that's based on the application code that your, your product development team is actually writing. The next phase in the software development lifecycle, the build phase, you can generate an SBOM there as well. And that starts to include additional other dependencies that might include the tools that your teams are using, uh, the programming languages and so forth, the, the other tools that go into the build. And then the analyzed and deployed phase where if you build a system image, for example, uh, you build the software that includes all of the things that are going into your product. 
at the source code phase, your teams are really focused on what is the first party code or what is the business logic code of what our product is actually trying to achieve. At the deployment phase, you have to package that into something that can actually run on the device. And that starts to include the operating system, for example, or other software that's included with that operating system or the services that are actually running on that device, which might be an SSH server, for example, or other file sharing or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you know, all of these things that are not necessarily directly part of what your product is trying to do, but are required for your product to function. And the reason I had this highlighted, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is because uh, as a company, Finite State started with binary analysis, which is a pretty complex topic, but the, it really is focused on analyzing the complete system image and not just the source code SBOM, for example. I'll get into some more details about that. Beyond the analyzed and deployed phase, then there's the runtime phase. So when this device is actually on a network and actually doing something, it can have its own dependencies. And those could be runtime dependencies, uh, they could be external services if your device calls out to the cloud, for example. Um, so at each phase during the software development lifecycle, from basically the inception of the idea for your product all the way to it is operating on someone's network, and then actually beyond into end of service and end of life, each of these has you know, different requirements, and there may be different software that actually exists on that product at each of those phases. And it's actually very important to understand what software is exists on those devices at every phase of that life cycle. So I mentioned VEX and VDR. Um, these are two different, I don't think I'm talking fast enough. I'm gonna go a little faster. <laughs> um, VEX and VDR, these are the, the two sorts of ideas behind communicating vulnerabilities in the software. So I mentioned uh, each of each software component can be correlated with vulnerabilities. These two ideas basically are talking about what's the exploitability status of a vulnerability and what's the impact of it. And then the other idea is what is the vendor doing about it, for example. The key thing that we're really pushing towards as an industry here is sharing this information. So you can think that if you're a vendor producing a product, you may have thousands of customers who are buying that product. If you're a customer and you're fielding a network, you may literally have thousands or tens of thousands of vendors who are, are producing different devices that are going on to your network. This really becomes a scaling problem. And this is where VEX and the concept of vulnerability disclosure is something that we are trying to streamline as an industry to be able to uh, let the vendor publish one time and have their customers all uh, be able to get that information. The way it's done now is, you know, a vendor has to communicate with email, for example, and they're emailing these things back and forth. You can imagine there's a ton of uh, communication that has to happen when you've got thousands of customers or when you've got thousands of vendors. And the reason I'm talking about this at length is because ultimately we're trying to focus on the problems in this space. And the main problem is there are too many vulnerabilities. When you start to look at the vulnerabilities that are reported against software, um, there are so many different words that are floating around in here. Um, are there threat actors that are using this vulnerability? What's the status of the vulnerability as I'm working to triage this in my systems? Um, the overall idea of the product security team is they need to be aware of a vulnerability and then actually keep track of it and do something about it. So understanding whether it's been exploited, understanding do you have enough intelligence about this thing? Um, what's the, the severity of it? What are the remediation options that I can take if I want to actually fix this? So let's see where we are. I'm not too far behind, I guess. So I'm really trying to set the stage here where for vulnerability management and product security teams, we're really starting to get to the point where everyone is using vulnerability management tools and these tools start to give you visibility. But as you're going to see, the visibility can start to show you that there are potentially thousands of reported vulnerabilities. And it's really difficult to understand what should my team focus on um, we really want to focus on this idea that the team's size is limited and their time is incredibly valuable. And ultimately, as I said, we're trying to make the world a safer place. 
So we're really focused on keeping up with the adversaries in this space. So our goals overall as, as a company and with our AI strategy is for us to move fast, for our customers to be able to move fast and ultimately reduce the work. So every time a vulnerability is reported, if a person has to go and triage that vulnerability to understand the severity and understand what it is they should do about it, that represents some amount of work, some amount of cognitive overhead for them to have to think about um, different problems. And ultimately, we want to make that process faster because, again, as I'm going to show, there is a lot of this information. So what we want to do is eliminate any false positives. We're working to determine what is reachable um, as far as vulnerabilities in a product and then ultimately getting to automating this process and making sure that we can actually audit the trail on these processes so that as we talk about compliance and regulatory frameworks, we can really have that, that sort of paper trail for who looked at the vulnerability, who determined it was exploitable or not. So, all right, finally, we're getting to you know the, the big headline, using large language models and a little, and I put data science here um, in, in parentheses, Again, we're focusing on kind of these areas where we want to get into faster development, developing high quality data and intelligence sources, and then ultimately using SBOMs and VEX and VDR and automation to be able to communicate these things at scale. So we're going to dive into a very specific use case here. And this is something that as we started to look at, why would we focus on the Linux kernel first? So here I'm showing you kind of a uh, an extract of a software bill of materials where we're showing software components that we've identified in a product, the versions of those software components, and ultimately, you know, how many security findings are associated with each of those components. And as we started to look at this, our company has literally analyzed hundreds of thousands of firmware. And in those firmware, a big percentage of them are built on Linux. Um, it is just an incredibly popular platform and it's incredibly well designed and defined and robust, uh, but it also comes with a very robust security community who is looking at the, the Linux kernel and reporting vulnerabilities about it. So as we got into this, the sheer numbers here, you know, when something is running Linux, it is uh, represents a huge number of the potential vulnerabilities that affect those devices or products. So I point out here that there's even a website that's dedicated to Linux kernel CVEs, and it's because the numbers are so big and because it's such an important system in the world of IoT and in critical infrastructure and other devices um, that it, it really comes down to there's a, a lot that, that people need to understand about these vulnerabilities. So I'm going to do a quick aside and talk about binary software composition analysis, where software composition analysis or SCA is the way that we analyze software to create an SBOM. The way that our company started again is really in binary analysis, where we're looking at everything that goes into the system. So it's not just the source code and it's not just that first party code, but looking at everything that gets installed when you've actually built a, a Linux based system. So we're looking at that to find all of the software that's installed. And part of that is identifying the Linux kernel itself. So I'm, I'm pointing out some of the, the more technical details here that the kernel can be built into a single binary image. But what we're going to get to is in the SBOM, we can actually identify the kernel and the kernel modules that are installed. And you can think of these almost like plugins uh, for the kernel. And they're determined at the time that you configure that kernel before you build it, which of those modules or plugins are going to be included in the Linux kernel itself that you're installing on that machine. So just kind of wanted to give a little bit of background because this is going to be um, an important part as we talk about where we're focused right now with AI and where we're going. Um, so a little bit more background, you have to understand the kernel vulnerabilities. Um, so as I said, there are thousands of potential CVEs reported against the Linux kernel. 
most times you can't just update the kernel to the latest version or you need to understand what's already in a legacy product that you've already sold out there into the world another little brief piece of information here is how do we match cves with the software that we that we put in the s bombs there are two terms here another set of acronyms cpe which is common platform enumeration and pearl package url which are the two main ways that you correlate a piece of software with the known vulnerabilities. This is important to note because in the National Vulnerability Database, every CVE has a list of CPEs, word salad or letter salad there for you, but almost all of the kernel vulnerabilities have the same and very broad CPEs, these descriptors that let you correlate software, and they're not very specific. So. We can get into the kernel CVE descriptions, and this is kind of the background for where I'm going with the, the first part of this research. But every CVE that's in the National Vulnerability Database has a description that goes along with it. And as we start to look at the kernel CVEs, we start to notice some things. There's quite a lot of words here, but something that stood out to us is these .c files. So these are actual file paths in the Linux kernel code that can tell us ultimately which module those those belong to. So the theory here behind kernel vision is we've identified the problem. There are so many vulnerabilities. There's not enough time to investigate all of them. The Linux kernel is the biggest contributor. And then looking at the CVEs, we see that their descriptions have source code file paths. So the theory here is, if the kernel module is not present, the CVE is not exploitable. The problem is, kernel CVEs and vulnerability intelligence sources don't have CPE or Perl information about the affected kernel module. So if you think about it, if they had this information, it would be very easy for me to just say, is this kernel module present? Does it, is the CVE affecting the kernel module? I can answer that question. Unfortunately, we don't have that data source. So we started looking at the vulnerability intelligence sources. We've talked about NVD, and I would say that it's basically not even close. The CPEs don't even contain enough data fields to represent this. I put a side topic here because there's a lot of discussion in the SBOM and VEX communities specifically about this problem. Um, we call it the naming problem, uh, colloquially, I guess you would say. Um, so that's a total aside. Uh, but then looking at the Linux kernel CVEs.com data, it is actually really nice. It's close, but it's not quite as complete as we want. And it doesn't have a well formatted sort of lookup the way that we're looking for. And other intelligence sources could hold this information because they basically use the Perl as a lookup. And Perls have this concept of a qualifier. Um, it's almost like the query parameters on a URL, for example, where you can add additional information into that package URL that we could hold this information. But right now, there was no source for us to actually find this information. So what are we going to do is develop that source. Problem is, I am not a kernel expert. I use Linux every day but I've never actually gotten deep into the kernel. I've never built my own kernel. So I didn't actually know how to start. So starting from scratch effectively here. Um, side note, Linux from scratch, check that out if you're really interested in building your own kernel. So with the advent of these new technologies, and unless you've been you know, living under a rock for the past year, I'm sure you've heard of large language models, chat GPT, uh, other models, the idea here is let's use some AI to get smart on this fast. So started looking into the Linux kernel build system and started asking the chat, you know, how can I start to solve this problem? So the real idea here, the first point is use these tools and technology to accelerate your understanding. I'd kind of describe this as if you're already an expert in something, you know, these tools can absolutely be a supercharger for you and for your teams. So any questions that you have that may be, you know, technical, it, the, the options are really endless here, but really focusing on using these tools to get more done more quickly. And we're going to talk about how we can incorporate this into our applications, into the overall vulnerability management um, space. 
so that we can actually bring these tools to you know the people who are actually doing the investigations and the analysis uh, of the vulnerabilities that we're talking about. So you'll start to see here where I'm asking some pretty highly technical questions and it gives me really good answers. And at the very least, it points me in the right direction so that I can pretty quickly come up to speed and understand a lot more about the kernel. So Aslan did describe, you know, my background is in software engineering and in cybersecurity. So obviously I'm starting here with quite a bit of knowledge, but again, not the deep sort of knowledge that I needed um, to be able to solve this specific problem so that you know, our customers and, and my clients can effectively ignore a whole bunch of CVEs that they don't have to think about. So trying to speed up their jobs. And then turning these ideas into actions a lot more quickly. Here you'll start to see, you know, this is what we would call a prompt when we're talking to, you know, any of these chat models. So the idea of creating a, a prompt that you're asking the model to continue to solve. Um, it's a bit of an art form, but it shouldn't be intimidating. You know, really, you, you can just start asking the questions. And if you don't get the answers you're looking for, start to revise that. But in this case, I got pretty specific that I want to modify the Linux kernel build system to enumerate the files, uh, the, the source code files, and which kernel modules they belong to. And right away, I started getting answers about how I can actually modify the kernel, uh, the kernel build system, and it started pointing me at some additional files that I needed to understand, such as the K build files that are part of the, the kernel build system itself. So really trying to supercharge what our development teams can do, what your development teams can do. And I've got quite a few more examples here, as long as I stay on time, that we'll be able to talk about as we get farther into this. But really this idea, use these tools again um, to move more quickly. And what this gets to is a system that can actually start to help me write the code. So to be honest, I didn't you know, quite know where to start you know, I had used make in the past, but maybe embarrassingly, not as much uh, to know exactly how to start to modify the make files in the kernel. Um, but, you know, the chat really started to tell me exactly how to do that and, and let me get this, this problem solved in a relatively very fast amount of time, actually. I put a note here that it's not completely foolproof. If you already know what you're doing, this can really help you. It's not going to give you necessarily the exact answer. Um, well, depending on which day you're watching this, you know, however many months into the future you may be watching this, they're, they're, the developments in this space are really happening so quickly. It's incredibly exciting, um, but yeah. So maybe I shouldn't say anything in absolutes at the moment, you know, just, just to, so that we're all clear um, that the tools right now got me really far along the way i didn't have you know exact answers that were coming out of this but again that comes back to my my background and my expertise that let me build this so now we built the kernel module mapper that maps our source code files to the kernel modules that that they belong to and now i can do that lookup um, so yes, a lot of more work went into this. There's, you know, the additional sorts of things like cleaning up the data and making it accessible and so forth. But the key idea here is this is a very, you know, pretty highly technical topic. And I was not necessarily an expert coming into this, but I was able to, you know, kind of supercharge my understanding of it, get in there a lot more quickly and actually build this solution. And, you know, ultimately, we're going to, to start to reduce the amount of work that people have to do. So I've got this slide as a quick rewind. You know, we started off actually in this space, um, hoping to solve some more challenging problems, even than the ones that we're talking about here um, with the kernel. Um, so ultimately, there's a lot of intelligence in CVE descriptions and the external references that they refer to. So website write-ups about vulnerabilities or exploit um, proof of concepts and so forth. So we really have already started building out different tool chains and these are actual software tool chains. So not just typing into the chat window in my browser, 
but writing code that can ingest a bunch of data from CVEs and descriptions and be able to go out and make queries and, and you know, uh, ask the large language models to fill in some of the blanks or to answer specific questions. So in some cases, it might just be a single call away to one of these large language models to build a more complex um, analyzer or parser because they are very good at natural language and, and those sorts of interpretations. So ultimately what we're working towards is building these sorts of reusable large language model software tool chains. So here again, I've got kind of just a, a little screenshot of one part of our tool chain where we're able to submit this information, give the language models context about the questions that we're asking for in the form of documents, and then ultimately be able to ask better questions about the data that we're showing it so that we can get better answers from it. So when we put it all together, we generate the SBOM. The SBOM has the kernel and the kernel modules. We correlate those with CVEs. We investigate each of those CVEs and then look up using our new intelligence data or our clean data source about which uh, kernel module is affected by that CVE. And then here, just searching the SBOM, is that kernel module present? And it's a bit simplified uh, in this case, but if it's not present, you can basically say the CVE is not affected. So, you know, each vulnerability that we investigate here can have a different status. You know, as you investigate a vulnerability, you may decide that your product is affected by that. Um, and that's something that you can, again, communicate with VEX and communicate with vulnerability disclosure um, and be able to actually, you know, put that into a process where you can remediate that let your customers know that you're remediating it or your customers, you know, on a, a lot of customer sides, they're doing things like pen testing. They may find vulnerabilities. They're not, not even reported yet. Uh, being able to communicate that back to their vendor who made that product and actually have that communication back and forth about a vulnerability again is, is part of where this whole market is going in terms of product security and vulnerability management. So, the typical results that we found here, 70% or so of the, the kernel CVEs are actually present. And I'd say this is an average, you know, it, it may not seem like a huge reduction, take 30%, but if I've got thousands of potential CVEs that I have to investigate, at least filtering out 30%, you know, is, is actually a, a pretty good head start. Um, this is the typical. In many cases, though, we are seeing even sometimes a 50% reduction. In some Linux kernels, it's up to 90% reduction. So you may find a kernel that's specifically built just for doing communication over Bluetooth, for example, and it does not have any of the other file system or file sharing or other drivers or anything else. And in those cases, it could be, you know, 1500 or 1800 CVEs suddenly comes down to a much smaller number of things that you actually need to, to pay attention to as a vendor. So uh, it, this is a pretty exciting and obviously this is kind of one sort of reachability analysis module that our teams have worked on. And over time, this will continue to improve and we can continue to build out other sorts of modules here. Um, that can take a look at vulnerabilities or take a look at security findings and figure out, is this thing reachable or not? And be able to automatically filter out anything that, that the security teams don't really need to pay attention to. So we're gonna get into a little bit more of this, but AI or large language models plus auditing and compliance, we think is actually going to be a very major topic. So the in intent and the approach that we're taking here is anything that has a non-deterministic output, especially, we want to keep track of pretty much everything about that. So if you ask the chat or the large language model the same question 10 times in a row, you may get 10 different answers. Uh, they may be slightly different. They may be very different. Um, so it, it has to be something that we need to keep track of which of these models were used. And this is where um, we talked about software bill of materials, but as we're moving forward, there's going to be the concept of machine learning bill of materials, the ML bomb, um, AI bomb. You know, these are different sorts of bill of materials where we're keeping track of 
uh, which models were used under the hood or what modifications did they make? What were the training data sets and so forth? So that's kind of a, a, a bit of an aside here of, you know, maybe inception of the, the bill of materials model that we're talking about, um, where we're generating bill of materials and we're actually keeping track of the bill of materials of the generator. Anyway, I didn't plan on saying that ahead of time, so I'm off the cuff here, but uh, keeping track of these things is important and it's kind of unclear right now what the requirements are going to be. Um, again, as we look at the CRA coming from the EU and, and that will start to take effect here probably over the next year, uh, one of the things you know that they're talking about is every vulnerability or, or every product when it ships may have zero known, known, known vulnerabilities. That's actually a pretty tall order, and it's going to represent quite a lot of work for software developers, for the software supply chain as a whole, and ultimately for product security teams to be able to investigate and give you know, a solid answer about any potential known vulnerability in any software that goes into their product. So everything that we can do to reduce the amount of work there and everything that we can do to keep track for the auditing and compliance and regulatory purposes um, is ultimately going to be something that uh, is not only helpful, but is potentially required. All right, so additional future in AI vulnerability management. Get out from under the avalanche, and I'm kind of describing it this way specifically because uh, many of my customers have hundreds of products or even thousands of products and in some cases we're seeing thousands or tens of thousands of vulnerabilities for products showing up when we start to actually do this analysis so when you haven't you know had this concept of the software bill of materials in the past you may be faced with quite a lot of vulnerabilities coming in and you know all of our teams are are working to help move all of these products forward um, and make them all more secure Part of that is the visibility that I talked about. What we wanna do is move forward out from under that, get out from under all, all of these total uh, numbers of vulnerabilities and get into repeatable, scalable, streamlined processes. And we think and are seeing evidence already that you know, these large language models and other AI tools uh, are really going to help us do, do exactly that, get us there faster. So some of the big challenges that we're focused on with our strategy, again, analyst time is potentially some of the most valuable time that our product security teams have. And we wanna make sure that it's being used appropriately, effectively, efficiently. So we're gonna focus on things like prioritization. Um, you know, Which of these things do I need to, to think about first? Triaging vulnerabilities and the workflows around that. Uh, giving the analyst advice and suggestions automatically. We're talking about the bill of materials. And again, I said bombs here and not just S bombs, because again, we're talking about uh, machine learning, the ML bomb, the AI bomb, but then there's also hardware bill of materials. Um, and ultimately it gets down to the supply chain. So ways that we can improve software identification. Uh, again, improving the triage and workflows around uh, managing your software bill of materials, the different software and versions and identification there. Provenance, where did these things come from? Um, are they changed from the original source where you know the software developers who built the thing, was it changed uh, between the time they built it and when I received it? What are the dependencies of the software? Remediation guidance, this gets into what can I do about this vulnerability? And so being able to offer specific upgrades or mitigation guidance, giving developers examples and specific code examples, or analyzing the configuration of the device and understanding the environment that that device actually operates in uh, can change all of the type of remediation guidance that, you know, what should you do about a specific vulnerability. And then for our customers who have, you know, many business units they've got hundreds of products that they're fielding and maintaining and need to keep up with portfolio management becomes really it's not a a big data problem but it's a huge data problem you know it's a huge communication 
problem? How do I keep up with all of these teams? How do I actually, you know, tell the developers when there's a known vulnerability that that something needs to be done about that vulnerability? So incident response automation, report generation, insights and planning. These are different, you know, types of things that we can use these tools to help us improve that portfolio management and actually, you know, get everybody in the organization operating on the same tool set, being able to operate on that quickly, keeping track of who's doing what and when they're doing it and when it's due. Policy and compliance, again, this is a huge uh, space that's that's upcoming. And our advanced analysis techniques. So again, we started as a binary analysis, you know, firmware analysis company, and there's actually quite a lot that we can do in this space using these tools as well. All right, I'm running behind on time. The types of user experiences that we can expect to see are going to start looking like you're seeing in other apps, quite frankly. Um, we've got this concept of actually using AI powered apps to operate on your security data, um, being able to use single click generators, you know, to helpfully uh, help analysts to summarize or generate reports or generate, you know, the comments that they want to put on a specific case they're looking at. We've got chat interfaces and co-pilots, and here I'm also talking about context awareness. So when you're looking at you know, a specific product and all the security information that you have about that product, being able to use these tools in the context of what you're looking at, in the context of the vulnerabilities that you're looking at, is going to become incredibly powerful. And then the concept of fine tuning and having private data models, um, really training these things in a secure way and keeping private models is going to be incredibly important, um, especially when you're talking about security data for your products. So I'm going to talk here instead of later about hallucination. Um, when you say hallucination in, in for anybody who hasn't heard this term, the large language models are not infallible. Um, there a lot of times they can just make up an answer. But as we're starting to see, when you fine tune these models, you can actually reduce that or eliminate that altogether. And you can make it so that your models operate in a, you know, a way that they don't just make up the answers. But training uh, a secure large language model and being able to host that uh, on your own without sending your private security data out to a cloud provider um, becomes incredibly important as well. And we're starting to see that with some of the major providers are already really taking this into consideration. So these are the types of experiences that we intend to incorporate into our platform and also that we expect to start to see throughout various tools uh, throughout the, the entire industry. All right, I've got quite a few sorts of uh, examples here where you know, we give it a prompt and say recommend an upgrade path based on component risk. And for example, what the, the language model comes back with is based on the context of what we're looking at. So here we've got some specific guidance about the best option for remediating the Zlib library, for example, and some very you know, interesting details here. It's recommended to update uh, as older versions may not receive security updates or support. There's interesting context in uh, what the the language model will will come back and tell you about what it is you should do um, what we're starting to see is we can say things like how can we fix the vulnerability in this code and with this context here we get very specific about you know how do i avoid the uh, the buffer overflow vulnerability and the xml parsing code and start to get back some pretty rich information um, using a specific function for example uh, and, and you can see here that, that this context can really help a developer, um, especially one who maybe doesn't have the security background uh, to understand how to write code securely and for you know, a specific use case. So really it's gonna be about education as much as it is about implementation, um, especially as we've got you know, an up and coming workforce of new developers who maybe don't have all the security background, but need to be security conscious. And their product security teams are helping them to, to be more product uh, secure conscious, you know, developing secure by design, for example, or cyber informed engineering. 
Um, these are some concepts where you know the developers need to be writing secure code, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. And so using these tools to help us do that, we think is, is going to really start to improve um, our throughput overall. Configuration analysis is another area. You know, what's the security impact of this SSH private key? And we can get back some really interesting information here um, about what is the impact it puts the server at risk of unauthorized access, the best course of action. Um, if it's needed for a specific purpose, it should be encrypted or protected uh, with, you know, file system controls. And it's also recommended to generate a new key pair to replace the compromised key. Uh, these are the sorts of details that as a security professional, you could just tell someone, but if we can incorporate this into the tools and keep that with the context of what the, the developer or analyst is looking at, we can sort of really get that information there more quickly. What's the impact and what are the consequences? So again, we're, we're really kind of demonstrating here some of the, the key things that you can get back just by you know, careful prompting and by providing the right sort of context to these tools. And when, I, we, when we talk about AI right now, we're really talking quite a lot about large language models. And I wanted to, to just be clear that you know, traditional machine learning and AI are not necessarily off the table here, but really we're focused on, on talking about this because of the significant developments that have happened over the past year or so. Um, and just the, the sheer number of people who are now aware of these tools and starting to use them. Prioritization, again, this is a, another huge area of, of where we can start to focus for our teams. Uh, so they know what to fix first. What can they put off until later, for example? Um, so this is pretty good guidance basically for you know, any product that we look at. Remove hard-coded passwords, remove expired certificates, fix the critical CVEs. Some of these things may seem obvious, but they're not necessarily um, obvious the first time you look at the analysis of one of these devices. So just being able to summarize this and take those steps to improve the security as quickly and immediately as possible, and then what do I do later? You know, fix these other non-critical CVEs and security enhancements. Summarization, you know, these are the, the three most impactful software updates to mitigate the risk in your product, for example. And I want to get to this insights where, you know, as again, as a product security leader, if you're thinking about what can I do across my entire organization, when we can start to analyze what are the common things that we're seeing across multiple teams or maybe all of our teams or across all of our products, what is the most effective thing I can do in terms of training my teams, for example? So this, this might come back and say, you need to train the teams on thorough input validation um, so that you're not subject to SQL injection attacks or OS command injection attacks or cross-site scripting. So this is a, the type of thing where we want to look you know, very deep you know, at a developer level. How can we help these developers or these you know, specific security analysts to, to look at and investigate and remediate a specific vulnerability, but then from a very high level as well, we can use these tools to start to get some insights across the entire organization. In the future of the, this space overall, we've talked about these fine-tuned and custom models. Um, we've talked about non-determinism, you know, and some of the text generation models. Um, but some of the things we haven't talked about are function calling, for example. So you know, these tools now are starting to be able to call out to other services. So when you ask a question, maybe it goes and searches the internet. Uh, maybe it goes and searches a search engine or goes to a custom API that you've developed. So really getting very high quality data um, into, you know, this sort of platform is something that wasn't possible just a few months ago and now is becoming very commonplace. And we wanna make sure that we're actually applying these tools to the vulnerability management space. Assistance and agents, again, this is where um, you can build a new model that has very robust expertise. So the cybersecurity expert assistant AI chat model, for example, or agents that can help you with workflows. Um, how do I go about remediating this? And then the others maybe are not as applicable for us or where we're thinking right now, uh, but there's definitely potential here and there's so much growth in this space um, that we're seeing that there's plenty of room for cybersecurity centric models. 
And I would be remiss if I did not mention, when you're thinking about AI and large language models, you have to think from a corporate security standpoint. And this is gonna come down to training as people start to use these models. Do not just send your proprietary and security data out into the cloud without understanding whether or not you're using a, a secure model or whether you've developed your own models. Um, you have to consider the potential impacts, which could be data leaking um, in between you know, different customers or, or it being incorporated into that model in the future. So really think about what should be shared and what should not and start to train your teams about that. And also, again, consider training and hosting your own custom fine-tuned models. Um, you know, we're, we're right now uh, working on on-prem models, basically, that none of this information leaves the premises in any way. Um, so this is especially important for very sensitive data. Okay, I don't think I talked fast enough, so I left us with four minutes for Q&A. <laughs> But I appreciate your attention. I hope that you got something out of this. I hope this was inspiring um, or informative in some way. And definitely, uh, I'm happy to talk more about this. So you can find me uh, on LinkedIn or you can email me. And again, I'm happy to have more conversations. And if we've got any questions um, in the chat, perhaps I can address those quickly. And again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see. I'm looking, it looks like I've got what is missed with each stage of generations of S bombs? What would be missed if you only run deployed and the others? That's a that's a good question. Let me go back. So we're talking about wow. This slide here. And the question is what would be missed if you just analyze the deployed or the deployed image to generate your S bomb? And a big part of the answer here is it depends. <laughs> if you are compiling your software, if if we're talking about, for example, a, a, a Linux image, you're going to get a lot of binary software. And because binary analysis is just generally more difficult than looking at a software manifest. Um, there is, is room for some potential fuzziness or false positives um, or misidentification of versions, for example, um, just because what comes out in the binary is a reduced amount of information than you would get directly from the source code or that you would get directly from a manifest. So what we see a lot is that you know, if you're only analyzing the binary image, you really need to kind of go through that and verify um, that the software that you think you've included has been identified correctly. Um, these systems are improving. Um, you know, there are uh, multiple advancements that are happening in this space. Obviously, we're, we're kind of focused on that quite a lot. Um, so getting enough uh, software intelligence and what we call ground truth information uh, from the the major systems that are are providing software in a packaged format even that's still difficult so um, it really comes down to uh, understanding where that sort of fuzziness exists and having the bandwidth to do the triage of that software so it is more robust in, in many, many ways. So again, identifying the operating system, identifying the various services, uh, but also finding software that's statically compiled into another piece of software. If you're including a, a libraries and, and just taking its source code and compiling it into your binary, in any other case, it wouldn't be clear necessarily that that software is included. But in many cases that we see, libraries like Zlib that we pointed out earlier, um, OpenSSL, these are very common libraries to be built into other software and making sure that you actually know that it's there uh, is, is a major step. And also analyzing third party libraries that come in or legacy where you only have the binary is a case where you're not going to necessarily have that source code. So you do have this as an option. Hopefully I answered that. 
correctly. Let's see, what time are we at? We're right at time. Emily, I don't know if you've got another one queued up. <laughs> uh, since we're right at time, I think we'll probably wrap up. Do you want to give the sign All off right. here, Nicholas? And any questions that we didn't answer, we'll, uh, we'll send out um, with the slides and things and, and reach out directly. Yep, I'm happy to follow up uh, with anybody later. And again, we'll be sending out the slides and the recording of this um, if you're interested. But once again, thank you very much. I'm Nicholas Vitovich, and this has been Accelerating Device Vulnerability Management with AI, Kernel Vision with Finite State. Thank you all. <laughs>